the Apostle Paul describes the church as being like a body. That applies to the global church, but it also applies to the local church. There are different parts to the body. And what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12 is that some parts can be seen, and they're the obvious things, like the worship that we've been looking at, the preachers that we hear, but there are also parts of the body that are unseen. And he says about the parts of the body that are unseen, first of all, they are indispensable. If you think about your kidneys, your liver, your heart, it's indispensable. And secondly, he says, they are worthy of greater honour. And that's true of the parts of the church that are not seen. They're indispensable. Those that work behind the scenes are indispensable and they are worthy of greater honour. And today, I have one of those who is indispensable to our church, HTB, and is worthy of a lot of honour, because he's the person who heads up one of the teams here, behind the scenes, that is absolutely indispensable to the work of HTB. I am here with Hilton Sunday, and Hilton, Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you are definitely indispensable at HTB. But before, before I even come to what your job is, because heading up the Verge, not everyone will know what the Verge is. We'll come to that later. But right now, just tell us a little bit about your background, because you grew up in apartheid South Africa. Yes, Cape Town, South Africa. Um, not a tourist destination part of the country, but uh, it was home. Um, and I was born in 1976, yeah. so this is the year when um, apartheid took a very violent turn. Students were being killed on the streets. Um, we commemorate this, um, this and year. And you were part of those who were being oppressed at that time? Yes, so we were classified as, as coloureds. And what, is that, what, did it, what did it mean? Well, I think here the term is dual heritage. Okay. Sometimes people say mixed race. Yes. I like dual heritage, all classified as coloured. Um, I don't know where the mix came in, Nikki, but somewhere along the line, um, races were mixing and we were sort of the in-between culture. Um, and you could even see it in the way we were positioned um, in our neighbourhoods. You had whites um, separated from us in this coloured area and then black further down in the country. So um, that's where we were, sort of in the, somewhere mixed in the middle. And yeah. your family were involved in the struggle against apartheid? Yes, these are my heroes. Um, Uncle Paul, Auntie Rhoda, who sadly passed away last year, um, gave their lives to fighting for freedom. Um, and they were imp imprisoned? Some of your family were imprisoned? Some of them spent time in prison, yes. One of my earliest memories is, is being on a beach, watching these policemen approach my, my, my parents, and then my mom coming towards me saying, we've got to go now. And when I protested and said, why? She said, it's because we are not white. Hmm. I, this this sort of, it sticks with me. I spoke to my mom actually on the phone the other day talking about this and she said that was the second time that day we'd been kicked off <laughs> a beach. Oh. <laughs> I admired her persistence. Um, actually a terrible, terrible thing. Terrible yeah. yes, but injustice. I, it is, but I, my, the point I always make about my life is if you, if you track the tra trajectory of it, um, I'm the beneficiary of people's sacrifice and struggle. Um, I don't claim to have struggled as much as, as anybody else. Um, like I said, born in 1976, by the time I reached high school in 1990, Mandela was released. I'd watched my, my older brother and sister um, come home early most days from school because of the violence and disruption to the education. And I thought that was my life up ahead of me. But it wasn't. He was released in 1990. I had um, undisrupted education. And in um, 1994, we had our first free and fair elections. And because I turned 18 on the 18th of April, 94, on the 27th of April, I could vote. Um, you know, so I transitioned with this country from into freedom. And um, so you were so the first generation to vote. Yes, yes. Um, so and then I'm you went to university? I did, um, first to a college and then to Stellenbosch University. And what did you university. study at college? I studied theology. And um, then you went to Stellenbosch, <laughs> which, Stellenbosch which is one of the, the finest universities in South Africa and probably in the world. Yes, um, and a, a place that previously I would not have been able to go to yeah. because of my colour. 
but it was open. Um, I even at that stage had uh, a few lecturers who were coloured as well. And um, yeah, very transformative and interesting time. And your faith, wh how did that start? You know, I grew up in church, um, but it wasn't until a teenager that I really found my own, my own faith. Yeah, my mother is super Christian, most joyful person you'll ever meet, um, despite all the struggle that she's been through. But your dad, had a, dad died very young? When I was six, yes, um, and he was um, a Muslim, mm. so we had that in the mix as well. Mm. So she was left with three young children um, on her own. Um, she's a tough woman, um, and so you've got to include that for her. So besides her struggle um, with apartheid, as a woman as well, there's another layer mm. of struggle added to that. And you know, she didn't complete her education. Um, it just wasn't seen as, as essential for her in those days. Mm. Um, so when I had a chance to, to study, you know, it was something that was encouraged. She made huge sacrifices to be able to um, afford my education. And Nadine, your wife, where, how did you yes. two meet? We met at school. Yeah. And she was like the girl next door, was she? Absolutely. Um, I've known her for most of my life now, and I'm so glad about that. <laughs> she is um, incredible, incredible. And um, then you were married before you left South Africa? Yes, so I completed my studies and a week later we got married. For our wedding, we asked all the guests just to give us money for flights and um, we had our honeymoon in London. Amazing. And we, we, we thought we'd spend a year in London. Yeah. And you've, you've basically never returned since then? We haven't. We struggled with that. That was a real struggle. Um, we slowly swear God was saying stay and I um, really struggled with that thought until one day in a connect group we were listening to an Indian pastor talk about his ministry and all that they needed back in India and I just talking at the back of my mind I'm just talking to my father saying oh Lord I can't help this gentleman um, you know my heart is for South Africa this is where we're sending money this is what we pray about um, my heart is for Africa Lord I, I don't think I can help and I heard God say something like well then we have a problem because my heart is for the world hmm. And I mean, that's just that's John 3.16, mm. just right there. And I went back to Nadine and said, I think we should say to God, wherever in the world we should live, whatever we should do, um, we'll do it. And um, that's what we did. Well, and we're very grateful because you ended up <laughs> with a job at HTV. <laughs> just say what you do here because um, you lead the Virgin. Now, people won't know what a Virgin is. What, describe what a Virgin does. Um, we do a lot of things. Um, it's a bit like a facilities manager role. We look after all of our venues, make sure they're welcoming for guests and safe, COVID secure and all of that. And we also make sure that um, our guests coming into church feel welcomed, no matter what um, stage of life they're in, or perhaps they have a mental illness, to make sure that they're comfortable and well looked after. Yeah. You've got two theology degrees, a master's in theology, <laughs> and here you are, you're working totally behind the scenes. Uh, but you're an amazing leader and the team that you lead. Just talk about how you lead that team because you have a, a really interesting way of leading. Um, I don't see leadership as um, something that I own. It's, it's given to me temporarily and so I share that out. Um, everybody gets a chance to lead the team. So um, just describe that means every day a different person is leading? Absolutely. So because of the volume of work and the complexity of it, um, one day is about as much as you can manage to organize. So each person gets a day and they, um, the day before, prep the team, tell them what's happening, get everybody into position, and they also, at the end of the day, leave the day so the next person finds the day running really well thereafter. One of the t people who was on your team is Joe Sullivan, and he was on yes. the team for like six, five or six years. Yes. Yes. Um, and you trained him and then he went on to, uh, now he's doing training for ordination and he was speaking on HTV at home I'm recently. I'm so proud of him. I'm so uh, proud of him. But so he would say it's entirely due to you. I hope he'd say that it was a team training him. Um, I mean, there were people saying to him, you should go to ordination bef long before he even thought that was an option. And, um, and, and also to the credit of the team, when I interviewed him, my thought process was, if we don't give him a job, no one else will. Because mm. he had <laughs> no qualifications at nothing, all. Nothing, and it was a horrible interview. It didn't go well. Um, 
And I went back to the team actually and said, look, there's this guy who will not be of use to us for a few years, but I think we should take him on. We've got what we need to build him up and we'll see the fruit later. Mm -hmm. And the team being what it was, um, all pitched in and said, yeah, we're on board with this. And here are the results. Amazing. Yeah. And he's now a phenomenal leader, speaker. We are so proud of him. Uh, Hilton, love to talk to you about like family and your children, because I know Joe Sullivan, who we just talked about, uh, one of the things he said is, he, having grown up in a very dysfunctional family, dysfunctional world, he never wanted to get married. But watching you and Nadine and your children transformed his view. And now, as you know, he's married and he's mm. had his first child, but that was watching your model. During all this time, uh, tell us about what was happening with your family and children. There was a day I was sitting in front of my uh, computer and I heard God speak and he said, I'd like you to adopt. Mm. Um, and it wasn't a command, it's more like a question, what do you think of that sort of a vibe to it? And I believe we have the Holy Spirit in us to give us the right response to God. And I just said, yes, um, definitely I'll do that. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it doesn't override who we are. So I was pitching in as well saying, um, but Lord, would you mind telling Nadine yourself? Because in my mind, I didn't want us to go away and sit down with a pen and paper and work out the pros and cons of adopting. We weren't earning much at that time. We were in a one bedroom flat. It just it didn't make sense, but I didn't want it to be a, a logical exercise. So I left it with God. I left it for many months. And one night we were at Focus listening to a, a talk. The church holiday. A church holiday away, yes. And Nadine just turned to me out of nowhere and said, do you think we should adopt? I, said, I think we should adopt. And I was like, well, finally, you've, you know, <laughs> you're on board. Let's do this. And um, that started a, a, a long journey, a seven year journey mm. of um, researching adoption and trying many avenues and failing and um, trying many different ways to achieve it. And just nothing was working until God stepped in and just phenomenally led us to, to adopt. When, when we had our first child, um, we were very precious over him. And I think he one day blinked too many times and we rushed him off to a hospital to have his eyes tested. And we spent like half a day having every test known to man performed on this poor child. And at the end of it, um, we were t I was told that his eyes are healthy. He simply needs glasses. And I was thankful, but I also had this question in the back of my mind, like, you know, Lord, his mother has beautiful eyes that work perfectly. You could have given him her DNA. Why am I busted genes that um, need glasses? And a week later, we got the results in the mail. And again, I was thankful, but I was like, I oh, know, Lord, sports is a hassle, and I've got a budget for two glasses now in the family and all that. Um, why didn't you just give him the Dean's wonderful eyes? And it was about a month later, I was in the kitchen, and all this came flashing back to me, and I remembered all of this. And I also remember that he doesn't have my genes, nor does he have Nadine's genes, he's adopted. And adoption is not a secret in our family, we celebrate it, um, but for some reason, I just looked at him as my child. Um, and in that moment, it was this sense of, Father, God, is this how you see me? Um, and it was a really big moment for me. Um, you know, um, Psalm 100 verse three says, we know that the Lord is God. He made us, we belong to Him. And it's just my firm belief that having God as your Father in this Christian walk must be understood and realized if you're gonna have any success in this faith. Mm -hmm. um, Father is not a description of Him or a title, it's His name. We mm -hmm. call Him Father God. Mm -hmm. That's, um, you know, it's Galatians 4. We are adopted in His family and we shout out, Abba Father. Mm -hmm. And it's this um, relationship that I have with him as a father that gives me my uh, perspective on life. It gives me my sense of um, worship. It grounds my obedience and also my healing. I find a lot of healing in calling him father. Mm -hmm. And I think um, for my family, that's what I try to project as well, that there's this father looking after us, this father guiding us, this father that heals us. And um, that's sort of 
where I take my parenting from. Then we had um, our second, I call him our DIY baby, <laughs> he's um, homemade. And, and then I thought two, two was a good number until Nadine came along and said, I think we should adopt again. At that point, I went away to God and said, Lord, if you send us another child, you've got to send me a pack of cigarettes because <laughs> I'm thinking of smoking, the, the stress will be too much. And I was totally against it. Um, and I kept praying, saying, Lord, please don't talk to Nadine. And then I slowly started praying, you know, Lord, someone's, someone's got to do something, Father. You've got to send people. I know what the situation out there is like in care and for children. Someone's got to do something. And then it slowly shifted to, Lord, you've got to give us another child. We have to be part of this um, solution. Um, I, I cannot stand by and watch. You must get us involved. Um, and I was fully on board with it, put a phone call through to the um, adoption agency and said, we'd like to adopt. And they said, no. <laughs> they were um, just flat out. No, your circumstances are, are not what we're looking for. Thank you very much. Uh, the next week I phoned again and they said, we'll call you back. They never did. So a while later I called again until they um, sent someone over to our home to discuss it with us. <laughs> and um, we now have our third child. Yeah, I know there was a, a crucial moment in your sort of faith journey when you first came here. Talk about when you, the experience that you had of the Holy Spirit. Um, when we arrived, I'd finished my studies, I had studied theology, even some bad theology of, of segregation and what that was about, and I was struggling with church a little bit. And one day as I was walking along the road, um, on my way to apply for another job actually, talking to God, he said apply to HDB, and I was, no, not a church. And um, I reluctantly, obediently applied to HDB. And the coming year, um, one evening in a service, um, we were sitting upstairs and Sandy Miller got up and just said, come Holy Spirit. Mm. And I mean, like, I had studied this, I'd been to so many churches, I'd never heard ministry like that before, just mm. come Holy Spirit. And I mean, that's my daily prayer now, <laughs> come Holy Spirit, before the kids wake up, uh, come Holy Spirit. Um, it's transformed my walk with God. Mm -hmm. um, the, the Holy Spirit is the, the power we need mm -hmm. to do what God requires. Um, there's no other way to do it. Your willpower, your goodwill, nothing will get you um, in the place you need to be except by being filled with God's Spirit. Yeah. Well, Hilton, you're a very good example of someone full of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> no, I Thank try. you so much. <laughs>